We've heard a lot of interesting information, a lot of very important information about the role of methyl donors uh, this afternoon. And I'm going to discuss another important role, which is the regulation of gene expression by DNA methylation. This is a picture of a bovine embryo at the blastocyst stage of development, the stage around day seven in the cow when the embryo undergoes its first differentiation event. And you can see that at this stage, these embryos already have become differentiated with respect to DNA methylation. The embryo in this picture has been labeled immunochemically with the antibody that recognizes DNA methylation. And the methylated nuclei label green. All of these cells are the trophectoderm that eventually become the placenta. And these cluster of cells in the middle, which are not very labeled, don't have very much DNA methylation, are the inner cell mass, which eventually gives rise to the embryo itself. So DNA methylation plays a fundamental role in determining whether a gene is turned on or turned off. And that can have important consequences for the function of the cell and also for the development of tissues and organs. So you can see that already at day seven of development, there's this variable expression of DNA methylation in the embryo. So this is kind of the epigenetics 101 and a very simplistic view of epigenetics. And I'm just going to focus on expression of a gene uh, by the regulation of its expression by a promoter upstream from the gene binding to a transcription factor. When a transcription factor binds to the promoter, it recruits other proteins that causes the gene to get transcribed, eventually the protein uh, encoded by the mRNA to be synthesized. What DNA methylation does is change the environment of this promoter region so that the transcription factor is no longer able to bind to the promoter. And instead of the gene being turned on, the gene gets turned off. Right? So this is not necessarily permanent. Genes probably get turned on and turned off all the time by DNA methylation. So these methyl groups can get removed, and then the transcription factor can bind to the promoter, turn the gene on again. But what's interesting about DNA methylation is that sometimes this methylation of the promoter can be inherited by daughter cells. So you can get a DNA methylation event, let's say in that blastocyst I showed a picture of a second ago, and that methylation can get inherited by the daughter cells derived from those blastocyst cells. And in fact, there's some evidence for transgenerational inheritance of DNA methylation. So some DNA methylation marks in a female, for example, can get passed on to the offspring. So what this is an example of is epigenetics, an inherited change in gene function, a gene like permanently silenced without any change in gene sequence. So it's a way to have inheritance without actually changing the structure of the DNA. And one of the characteristics of DNA methylation is it's very sensitive to the environment of the cell. So different signals affecting the cell, and as we'll talk about today, maybe nutritional factors can affect whether or not this promoter is actually getting methylated or not. So, I mean, this is a very simplistic view of epigenetics. In fact, there's a lot of other uh, modifications of the DNA and of the histones surrounding the DNA that contribute to epigenetic regulation. And several proteins get recruited to the site of DNA methylation. 
to facilitate the silencing of genes. Not all DNA methylation causes gene silencing, depending where it's located. You can get gene activation. But just for the purposes of this talk, I'm just going to talk and think very simply. Uh, methylation of promoter regions leads to a silencing of DNA. Or, and this is really important for the early embryo the embryo in the first seven days of life in the cow, because there's dramatic restructuring of all the DNA methylation on the cells of the early embryo. So the sperm DNA is methylated, the oocyte DNA is methylated, right? They have memory. I was a sperm cell, I was an oocyte. And all that has to be removed in order for the embryo to develop. So here's a two-cell embryo that, again, has been labeled for global DNA methylation. So you can see these two nuclei are pretty green. But after the embryo forms, almost all the DNA methylation marks are removed from the embryo. So those cells can reestablish themselves as all the future cells of the body, not be programmed to be sperm cells and oocytes anymore. So there's a reduction in DNA methylation at the four cell stage, the eight cell stage, and then new methylation marks get put back on. So you can see these nine cell to 25 cell embryos got more DNA methylation, these 32 cell embryos, et cetera. So this is a really critical period in the life of the embryo when it's being programmed for future development. So this slide here just illustrates the same idea. Here is the total amount of methylation of the DNA. So during uh, development of gametes, sperm cells get methylated, oocytes get methylated, Following fertilization, the male inherited DNA methylation gets removed almost immediately after fertilization, whereas the female DNA methylation also gets removed, but in a much slower way. And then thereafter, these DNA methylation marks get put back on. So what happens if this pattern of DNA methylation is altered during early development? If you increase the amount of methylation or decrease the amount of methylation, there's the possibility of causing large-scale downstream effects on the tissues and organs that are developing from these uh, early cells of the embryo. So kind of the hypothesis that I'm exploring today is that changing the environment of the pre-implantation embryo. So I'm especially talking from day zero to day seven of pregnancy in the cow. It can change DNA methylation at critical genes in the genome of the embryo. A lot of those changes probably are just temporary and later change into something else. But my hypothesis would be some of these changes persist and can cause a change in the phenotype of the embryo when it becomes a neonatal animal and even persist into adult life. So my hypothesis is changing the environment of the embryo changes its DNA methylation, and that can program postnatal phenotype. And then I guess I'd further develop this hypothesis and say that one of the aspects of the environment of the embryo that changes DNA methylation is availability of methyl donors. Maybe if there's more methyl donors in the local environment of the embryo, it experiences a different pattern, 
a DNA methylation than if the environment has less uh, methyl donors available. So it's well established that changing the mother's environment during the earliest stages of embryonic development can have long-term effects on the offspring. This is a study from the mouse. There's Mickey and Minnie. So they were mated. And then after Minnie was mated, I guess there were a bunch of Minnies in this experiment. Some of them were assigned to a high protein diet, fed 18% casein. And others were fed a low protein diet, 9% casein. And they were fed this experimental diet for just three days. That's how long it takes a mouse embryo uh, to get to the blastocyst stage of development. And thereafter, both groups were fed 18% casein. And then after birth, the pups were raised until 28 days of age. So this experiment by Tom Fleming is examining how does changing the protein environment of the embryo just for three days affect the phenotype of the pup. So gestation is about 21 days in the mouse and then another 28 days of postnatal development. What they observed was a sex dependent effect of early nutrition. And this is a really common observation in fetal programming or developmental programming. Males are affected differently than females. So you can see, if we look at body weight at 21 days of age, for males, which are heavier than females, it doesn't really matter whether they were in a uterus exposed to a high protein diet or a low protein diet. But in the females, those females that were derived from mothers fed a low protein diet just for three days had a higher body weight uh, at 21 days of age than uh, the 18% casein group. We can see also major effects of the environment of the cow embryo on the postnatal phenotype. So my lab, we do a lot of embryo culture, embryo transfer. So when we do that, we culture these embryos in a really artificial environment, right? They're living on plastic instead of in the uterus. And they're exposed to different concentrations of nutrients that are probably different than what they're exposed to in vivo. And these embryos differ a lot biochemically from embryos produced in the cow. And occasionally, maybe about 2% of the time, fetal development becomes severely disrupted in, in these embryos. And we get this large offspring syndrome. So this is a Holstein calf, you know, 100 pounds at birth, right? 200, I'm sorry, 200, yeah, even, yeah. Glad you can convert from kilograms to pounds. So this phenomenon is caused by some alterations in the genetic regulation of growth processes as a result of something that happened uh, very early in embryonic life. And this is a, another example of a large offspring fetus at uh, 86 days of gestation. Here's kind of a control fetus. You can see this large offspring fetus um, has a fetal weight of 354 grams, over twice that of the control fetuses. One other example of developmental programming that doesn't involve methyl donors is for this growth factor colony stimulating factor two. This is a molecule that's uh, produced by the oviduct and the uterus of the cow. The cow, for, the cow embryo first enters the uterus around day four to five of uh, development. 
So in vitro, we've done a series of experiments where we provide CSF2 to developing bovine embryos beginning at day five after fertilization. So the embryo is exposed to CSF2 for two days and then placed back in the uterus. So just this two-day exposure to CSF2 can affect the embryo at day 15 of gestation, can affect the fetus at day 86 of gestation, and can affect growth of the calf after birth. So for example, at day 15, CSF2 treated embryos have a different length. The females have a smaller embryo size. The males have a larger embryo size. There's large scale changes in the expression of genes by the embryo. And if we look at DNA methylation marks, there's about 9,000 DNA methylation sites that are differentially methylated at day 15 because of the presence of CSF2 from day five to seven. At day 86, we also see changes in DNA methylation in the skeletal muscle of the fetus and to a lesser extent in the liver. There's no effect to CSF2 on birth weight, but subsequent growth in a small number of animals that we examined was greater for the CSF2 animals than for the control animals, right? So no difference in birth weight, but after four months of age, the, these are all heifer calves, the heifers derived from CSF2 treated embryos grew faster than the heifers from the control group. So that's an example of changing the environment just for a few days in early development and having long-term effects on the fetal development and postnatal development. Also associated with changes in DNA methylation. We haven't proven that it's the DNA methylation that causes these effects, but it's likely that they're involved. So what about the consequences for the early embryo of feeding dietary supplements that provide supplemental methyl donors, methionine or choline. There's an experiment in the mouse that suggests regulating methyl donor availability in the mother can affect DNA methylation of the fetus and phenotype of the fetus. So these are genetically identical mice they were both gestated in utero in mothers that were exposed to the environmental toxin uh, BPA, which causes obesity, diabetes, and some of the effects of BPA are mediated by changing DNA methylation. You can see this mouse has got this agouti colored hair coat which is controlled by the level of methylation of the agouti gene. But this mouse is of normal body size and has a darker hair coat because the agouti gene is turned off. So the only difference between these two mice is this mouse's mother was fed a diet supplemented with choline, uh, betaine, and s methionine three methyl donors. And the agouti gene ordinarily functions to block activation of the melanocortin receptor. So melanocortins bind melanocortin receptor, which causes uh, pigment cells to produce this black eumelanin pigment that creates the dark hair coat. But when agouti is present, it blocks this pathway, so you get a more yellow or reddish looking pigment. So in that big fat mouse, the agouti gene was active, but in the little skinny mouse, the methyl donors caused methylation of the agouti gene so that um, 
this inhibition of the MC1 receptor did not occur. So that's just illustrated here. Bisphenol A causes hypomethylation so that you get this pronounced agouti hair coat as well as all the other effects of bisphenol A. But those effects, including regulation of the agouti gene, but those effects can be blocked by feeding uh, methyl donors. So when we talk about DNA methylation, what are we talking about? We're talking about taking a cytosine on the DNA and transferring a methyl group from S adenosyl methionine. Using this enzyme, there's actually a series of them called DNA methyltransferase. So the cytosine gains a methyl group and then all these proteins associate with it and silence the promoter region. So one question then is, if we increase the amount of S adenosyl methionine, can we drive this reaction to the right? Can we increase the amount of DNA methylation? Well, how would we do that? By providing either S adenosyl methionine in the diet or precursors to S adenosyl methionine, like methionine, betaine, like was done in those mice, choline, like was done in those mice, and also folic acid, which was another ingredient in those mouse diets. So if we increase methyl donors, increase the supply of S adenosyl methionine, do we increase DNA methylation? And does that have consequences for the developing fetus? So in the last part of my talk, I want to talk about a series of experiments done by a graduate student of mine, Eliab Estrada, where he asked the question, what is the effect of supplementing the early embryo, the early in vitro produced embryo, with the methyl donor choline? What is its effects on the characteristics of this blastocyst that is produced in culture? And then what is the long-term consequences on the animal derived from that embryo, on the neonate and on uh, the weaned calf? And as you can tell from this slide, this was an experiment. The in vitro studies were done with embryos of undetermined genetics, but the embryo transfer study was done using uh, Brahmin cattle here at the University of Florida. So we have to be a little careful here. We're studying choline. Choline's a methyl donor, but as was discussed earlier by the other speakers, choline also does other also can be phosphorylated to produce phosphatidylcholine. The embryo is synthesizing lots of membranes during early development, so it presumably needs the capacity to synthesize phosphatidylcholine. Choline also can be acetylated to form acetylcholine. We don't know what the role of acetylcholine in the embryo is, but there are receptors for acetylcholine on the embryo. So these experiments with choline might involve uh, regulation of DNA methylation or could involve other actions of choline. So that's Elia Bestrada with uh, one of the calves that he produced from this experiment. Now he really, I have to say, developed this research uh, pretty much single-handedly. And the very first experiments he did used in vitro produced embryos. There's no choline in the culture medium of uh, the standard culture medium that we use for embryos. So he added choline at one of four concentrations, zero millimolar, no choline, 1.3 millimolar. If you sum up all the choline metabolites in the blood at one week postpartum, it equals 1.3 millimolar. So that's how we chose that. Now, most of the choline in the blood is phosphatidylcholine. 
we can't get phosphatidylcholine in solution at that concentration. So we added choline chloride. So that is something to think about. Then the second dose he added was 1.8 millimolar. So that's just 1.3 millimolar plus an additional 0.5 millimolar. And that concentration was chosen because of some work by Marco Sanobi that feeding rumen protected choline reassure the postpartum cows increase the total amount of choline in the blood by about half a millimolar. And then the last concentration he tested was 6.37 millimolar, which is the sum of all the choline metabolites at week 10 postpartum, kind of when cows are ordinarily inseminated. So he did a bunch of experiments asking, what are the effects of these choline concentrations on the embryo? I'll just show you some of the data. One of the things we look at in the IVF world is how many newly formed embryos can develop to the blastocyst stage, the further stage we can develop culture embryos in vitro. And usually the stage when embryos are transferred to recipients. He did lots of experiments on effects of choline on development. And in general, there's no effect of varying the choline concentration on development. If he adds very low levels of choline, there's a slightly positive effect. He looked at the expression of 93 genes that are important for embryonic development in the embryos that made it to the blastocyst stage. And 10 of these genes were affected by choline. In each case, the expression of the gene was most altered by 1.3 millimolar choline. So adding slightly more choline to 1.8 millimolar had no effect, and neither did 6.37. But adding 1.3 caused an increase in this gene AMOT. This is a very important gene for the embryo. NANOG, another important gene. Histone deacetylase involved in epigenetic signaling, also upregulated. We don't have any data for the lower concentrations, but at least at 1.3 millimolar, there's an effect of choline on gene expression. Then he also looked at the effects of 0, 4 millimolar choline, 1.3 millimolar, and 1.8 millimolar on DNA methylation and embryo cell number. This 4 millim 0 0.004 millimolar, that's the concentration of choline chloride uh, in the blood at one week postpartum. Again, no, no effect on embryonic development except a slight improvement for embryos receiving the lowest concentration of choline. No effect on blastocyst cell number, but there was an effect on DNA methylation. So culturing embryos in the presence of choline increased DNA methylation, but only for the 1.3 millimolar group, just like we found for gene expression. We're not sure if we're downregulating transport mechanisms or what, but at 1.3 millimolar, there's a significant increase in methylation. There's also a slight increase at uh, 4 micromolar. We also looked at lipid content of the embryo because of its effects on phosphatidylcholine uh, production. Huge effect of adding supplemental choline on lipid accumulation in the embryo. These embryos have been stained with something called Nile Red, which gets taken up by lipid and fluoresces green, even though it's called Nile Red. And you can see these 1.3 millimolar embryos have a lot more lipid than embryos uh, from the other treatments. And that's quantified here. So 
if you culture with choline, you get some effects on DNA methylation, some effects on gene expression, don't really change the competence of the embryo to develop. Well, what are the effects on the ability of the embryo to establish pregnancy? We don't have a lot of data on that. Those are experiments that require a lot of numbers. And what are the effects on the offspring? So to test this hypothesis, we used uh, Brahmin females as oocyte donors, fertilized those oocytes in vitro with Brahmin semen, and then cultured the embryos for seven days with either no choline or 1.8 millimolar choline. And then those embryos were then transferred to recipient cows, Angus cows or Brangus cows. We did pregnancy diagnosis at 28 days after ET, and then the birth weights were measured and the weaning weights. This is not significant. Tendency for lower pregnancy rate per ET for embryos that were treated with choline. We did another experiment with Holstein cows that I'm not showing. We found just the opposite, slightly higher pregnancy rate, but not significant. We're not really making any claim about the pregnancy rate. Pregnancy rate was lower in the choline group for the animals that actually established pregnancy. But here are the interesting data, not just station length, which was not affected by treatment. This experiment was done as part of a project to produce Brahmin calves for the University of Florida. So we used a lot of sex semen in producing the embryos. So we have more data on heifer calves than on bull calves. But when we look at birth weight, you can see that birth weight was significantly higher for the calves born from the choline group. So four kilograms higher in the females and about three and a half kilograms higher in the males. Here's the individual variation in uh, birth weight. And this difference continued at weaning. So if we look at adjusted weaning weight uh, for 205 day weaning weight, there's a significant effect of choline on weaning weight. So in the females, we got 24 females. There's a 14 kilogram difference in weaning weight. <coughs> Excuse me. And in the males, we have a lot fewer males, but there's still about a 24 kilogram difference in birth weight in the males. So, treating embryos with supplemental choline chloride from day zero when they were zygotes to day seven when they were blastocysts looks like it programmed the pattern of fetal development in these embryos so that by the time they were neonatal calves, they were heavier and had greater ability to grow postnatally. I guess I still need this water. We're going to repeat this experiment. We're going to repeat it with in vitro produced embryos just like this take the animals to slaughter to evaluate whether the differences persist to slaughter. And then we're going to do another experiment with uh, Nicholas DiLorenzo, where we're going to feed rumen protected choline around the period from AI until day seven and see whether or not we see the same kind of programming effect <coughs> achieved by uh, supplemental choline. So I'm going to end this talk with this equation I learned in 1974 at the University of Illinois when I took Animal Science 101, which is that the phenotype of an animal is dependent on two things, the animal's genetics 
and the animal's environment. And so variation in phenotype is due to variation in genetics and variation in environment. And of course, the kind of things we're interested in livestock production are phenotypes like weaning weight, weight gain, litter size, milk yield, fertility, disease resistance. You know, we've made outstanding progress as animal scientists in manipulating this genetic variation to improve the phenotypes we're interested in and to developing tools to regulate the environment that an animal executes its genetic program in. So, you know, we have very good technologies now for identifying genetically superior individuals and propagating them. And we've also spent the last 75 years identifying what features of the animal's environment can affect the phenotype of the traits we're interested in. And we've developed a great set of tools to try to regulate that environment, regulate the animal's nutrition, its photo period, its housing, what drugs we give it, all to optimize the phenotype uh, that pays the bills. You know, here's, here's the change in uh, genetic merit for milk yield from 1960 through 2019. It's doubled during that time. But what I would say here, when it comes to the environmental impact or the environmental component of phenotype, all of our effort, or almost all of our effort, has focused on what happens to the animal after it's born. But it's becoming increasingly obvious that an animal's adult phenotype depends to some extent on what happened to it what environment it existed in before it was born. And as early as the first few days of uh, embryonic life. So I think there's a great opportunity for us to try to understand what the important features of the environment prenatally is for postnatal phenotype and then regulate that. So I want to thank uh, the different people who were involved in all of this work I showed you. This slide seems really screwed up. And, ah, because I replaced it with the good one. So I especially want to thank Elia Bestrada. Jeremy Block played a crucial role in the embryo transfer studies. Luis Seguera produced two of those uh, abnormal fetuses I showed you. And Liz Janeman was very important in the ET project as well as Danny Driver and the crew of uh, people working for him at the Beef Research Unit. So I'll be glad to take any questions or comments. All right, very nice presentation. Uh, is there any questions for Dr. Hansen? Lady Hansen. Go ahead. Have you thought about looking at composition of the animals when you're doing the slaughter study because you see that increase in lipid in the, the embryo? Yes. I mean, so we've looked at ribeye area. Hasn't really changed. But in this new project that we're going to do, we're going to take them to slaughter, and then we're going to examine uh, carcass composition, tenderness, do some work on the muscle fibers and uh, longissimus. So yeah, we're definitely interested in that. Dr. McFadden. So familiar with this uh, transition cow study that was done at the University of Illinois, and they were, they were feeding um, no or rumen protected methionine and they were looking at methylation and one of the conclusions was is that methionine lowered global DNA methylation but then it increased gene specific methylation and they were looking at like PPAR or something. I, I don't know anything about methylation but could you 
sort of allude to what that mechanism but might be about how you can have differences on a gene-specific level in terms of methylation versus global? I don't understand how you can have that kind of regulation. Yeah, so we labeled some of those embryos for, okay. uh, for part of that study. And that was, so, I mean, we, he fed rumen-protected methionine, and you would hypothesize that would increase the amount of uh, DNA methylation in the blastocyst that he produced. But what he found was, yeah, a decrease. Yeah, I actually don't have a very good explanation for that. Of course, what's important is uh, concentrations of methionine at the level of the embryo and not in the blood. I don't know how much methionine gets across into the uterus. I think probably the concentrations of methionine in uterine fluid are similar to the blood. The embryo takes up very little methionine. If you look at uh, amino acid uptake by the embryo, methionine is one of the ones that's not taken up very much. So maybe changing the environment of methionine extracellularly doesn't really change very much the concentrations inside the embryo. That doesn't explain why it went down. I mean, I don't really have a good explanation for that. And of course, when you talk about individual Regulation of individual genes versus globally. I'm sure when I'm looking at global DNA methylation, not every gene is being regulated equally. And it may even depend on the tissue, right? So maybe, you know, 200 genes are being more methylated in one treatment and another 200, and it's a lot more than 200 methylation sites. And I think we know very little about how, how changing methyl donor availability would regulate one gene rather than another gene. Any other questions? Yeah, so I, sort of a, I have a question. And it's related to basically what you just said. So, you know, we're doing these experiments and you're putting in, we don't necessarily know, right, how much choline or methionine or folic acid or anything that is really going into those uh, embryos initially, correct? So when we change them, you know, could we be throwing off the entire system because we're just putting too much of one of them in? We were discussing this in a lab meeting today and one of my postdocs said, you know, we shouldn't just throw things at the embryo and see what happens. We should be able to understand the biology and have a hypothesis as to what would happen. So, I mean, I think that's a very good point. But we know nothing, right? We, we, so, we almost are just like guessing and seeing. And, you know, we hypothesized choline would have beneficial effects on calf growth, but we had no reason to think that. It was just a guess. I mean, it could easily have had no effect or have it have stunted growth. And, you know, we don't know what other concentrations would do. So, I mean, we're really just beginning. And, and we also don't know to what extent, you know, one of the things about epigenetics, everybody focuses on the fact that it's inherited. So something happens to you when you're a fetus, and then when you're 60 years old, you get cancer because you had the wrong epigenetic event when you were a fetus. But a lot of these events get reversed, so they're not all fixed forever. So, I mean, it is possible we could program the epigenome in a good way early in development, and then maybe something happened later that would reverse some of that. You know, so we're just beginning to learn all this stuff. Oh, I think we have a question back here. Hi, Dr. Hansen. Thank you. It's a very good presentation. So my question with the, you use 1.37 millimolar that have more gene expression, one of your <coughs> genes. So do you think uh, that was the plasma concentration of some stages of the animal? So do you think the plasma concentration of the choline represent the histotroph composition for the choline 
are you expect the same as that of the plasma? That's my one question. And uh, if you increase the concentration of the choline in culture, like 1.8, you have a lot of phenotypes that increase the weight. So do you think it changes the pathway towards more of the phosphatidylcholine synthesis as compared to the methylation pathways? So how you would come in? Yeah, so the first question, does, does the choline concentration and composition in the blood reflect the choline concentration and composition in uterine fluid, or vice versa, I guess? So we don't know. <coughs> we want to look at that. All I can say is choline is present in uh, uterine fluid. So it does, as you would expect, it does get across into the uterine fluid. But we don't know to what extent um, the composition might change as compared to blood. And then the second question, I th would you repeat it again? Sorry. So you use 1.8 millimolar concentration supplement in the culture, right? As compared to the no choline. So do you think at higher concentration, you don't have the gene expression differences, but you have more weight gain? I don't know if you do 1.37, you would have the same weight gain differences. It's possible, right, for sure. That's a, that's a possibility. All right. All right, time for one more question. Uh, why did you decide to use, uh, as treatment, the plasmatic concentrations of choline or... Why did we choose to use... As treatment in your experiments, the plasmatic concentrations and not the well, concentration of choline or methionine or... And not the concentration that you actually can find in the uterine fluid or the obiductal fluid? Because we don't know the concentrations in uterine fluid. You know, one, one problem is... How do, you, how do you obtain uterine fluid? I guess you could suck it out with a syringe, but if you open up a, a uterus, there's no fluid sloshing around. You can put a tube in the uterine lumen and let the fluid drain, but of course you probably induce some kind of inflammatory response and change the composition. So everybody flushes. So then you know what's in the uterus, but you don't actually know what the original concentration was. So you know, that, that's a problem that we faced. So we kind of assumed they were more or less the same, but we don't really know the answer. And of course, it's very, I mean, to be honest, it's very artificial what we did. Most of the choline in the blood is phosphatidylcholine at a fatty acid composition that is much different than the purchased phosphatidylcholine you would buy from Sigma. So you know, embryos are never exposed to 1.3 millimolar choline chloride. So th they're converting that, presumably, to phosphatidylcholine and, and other metabolites. So it is, it is ar artificial, the, the concentrations we use. Okay. All right. I think that's it. Thank you. We'll give one more round of applause.